Good afternoon. To those of you out there in the audience who've uh, listened to a talented array of PhDs sort of predict the future and talk to you about really fascinating things, I've been saying, you know what, I really wish a lawyer would come and talk to us for an hour. <laughs> You're in good, good hands here. Um, for those of you who aren't of that mindset, I apologize, but I'll try to make this as painless as possible. But what I'm going to do is sort of walk you through um, a number of legal and regulatory uh, issues that are percolating not only in Texas but nationally that um, I'm describing as is kind of the framework that we're placing around everything that we've talked about. I do ag law and really deal mostly at the producer level. Um, I follow um, not only law but sort of the policy changes pretty closely. And you know, all this is very fascinating to me. We've got to produce 70% more food in a reasonably short period of time with less land and less water. But when I talk with the producers and I sort of look at their operations, I realize they're not only going to have to endure those changes, but they're going to have to do, endure some, some very significant policy and regulatory changes that are going to wrap around this, this scenario that we've talked about today. Um, how many of you heard about three weeks ago uh, heard of this article the NPR did about the uh, hay farm in, in, in uh, Arizona growing hay for Saudi? You know, it's pretty fascinating, and the more I've thought about that, um, the more fascinated I've become by it. I mean, it's it's fairly elementary in in one sense, but for those of you who haven't read the article, I mean, in essence, uh, in a county in Arizona that that in essence has unrestricted groundwater uh, regulations they rather stumbled upon this large facility out there growing hay, which is a fairly ordinary thing to do. But the hay farm is owned by um, uh, Saudi Arabia's largest dairy. You think, why would they be owning a hay farm in Arizona? But then you start unrolling this, and Saudi Arabia, of course, who has plenty of money, very little water, but they need milk, and they have built scale dairies in Saudi Arabia, is producing and has purchased this dairy uh, to grow hay there and of course ship it halfway around the world to feed the cows that are going to produce the milk in Saudi Arabia. So it's kind of notable, fascinating, a gee whiz sort of thing, but if you begin to b think about what we're here to talk about, climate change, natural resources, and the changes that are going to take place, that's why I think this is really, really instructive. Incidentally, as they went out there and started looking at this, became a little more fascinated. There was a, there was a facility owned by the United Arab Emirates, uh, by China. You know, once the word is out as to, to, you know, where the resources are and what you can do, one thing follows another. But, I mean, we're at a point now today in 2015 where we're growing alfalfa hay over here uh, somewhere uh, just outside of Los Angeles in North America and shipping it. 8,000 miles around the globe, hay, not known as a high value product. It's not electronics, it's hay. And the reason why that's possible, of course, is soil quality and availability of groundwater. The absence of restrictions on that groundwater certainly plays a factor in that, but it's not, it, that doesn't answer 8,000 miles. It's availability. You've got a population base um, halfway around the world that needs fresh milk. You've got to have the cows there. So you grow hay there in Saudi Arabia. So I sort of throw that out there as a lead-in is not only a sort of this fascinating wow thing, but to sort of grab hold of, you know, we tend to look at groundwater regulation and things just Texas-wide or locally or even just in the United States, but this whole regulatory structure that we have or that we don't have and the laws that we have really sort of govern some, some fairly monumental changes um, that are going on around the globe. Um, Ch Chad covered some of the um, um, land trends report, and just to give a little plug for that, for those of you, how many of you are familiar with the land trends report that IRNR did? I mean, if you're not, um, you should pull that down. I mean, it's the most fantastic study that has been done of basically land use in Texas in the ag uh, area, but it's got some, some incredible statistics. Reduction in land. I mean, if you look right here between, uh, say, you know, 2002 all the way to 2012, one decade, that's a significant drop in the available land. We're trying to produce a monumental amount of food, an increasing amount of food, but our land is, is being reduced. 
Same thing with ownership size. Um, there's a tremendous change in the distribution there between the ownership size of farms. And then everybody in here knows the, the rocket population um, changes that are going to be taking place here in Texas, which is going to put a lot of strains on um, water. You know, here are a few of the factors, um, you know, that, that are going to come into play for agriculture as we move ahead and try to produce all this food is, is, is reducing land, reducing water. We're seeing deforestation, which is going to sort of, you know, play into these climate changes, but make our job a whole lot tougher. One of the biggest issues that I've spent a lot of my time as a lawyer in, which is a real factor when you're trying to increase the scale of production, is agriculture runoff. We've got an enormous issue in the United States with nutrient loading and streams, which is not all the, 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 a fault of, of agriculture, but we're a player in that. And that's a big, big, that's on the radar screen of the regulators as well as the cities who tend to treat that water. So I'm, I foresee that we're going to have a, a, a sea change and a, a set of increasing regulations as the decades go by on nutrient regulations uh, back on the farm. Okay, waters of the U.S., a mildly uh, non-controversial topic. <laughs> um, I wish we could debate this. I teach law class at Texas A&M Ag Law, and we, you know, th those poor kids probably had to endure three lectures on waters of the United States. But it's a really, really interesting topic. I'm sure everybody knows what that is. Um, it's an EPA core uh, policy that has come out, just came final several months ago. Um, it's currently uh, suspended by federal court injunction. The Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals has that rule in abeyance. Um, right now, its primary purpose is um, employing half the lawyers in North America. Half are fighting it and half are trying to defend it. But it's a reality. And for those who are not familiar, just in short fashion, what this is is a, a, a definition or a redefinition of, of waters of the U.S the triggering jurisdictional area for the Clean Water Act. In short, maybe more countryfied definition, what this is is it's a definition of the line of how far back up into the pasture or the land area that the federal government or the EPA can, can regulate. Up to now, it's primarily been your large streams, your tributaries, things that flow most of the year. This new rule um, significantly alters that it moves in those tributaries back up to, in essence, that area in the pasture where I tell producers where uh, your rainfall begins to collect and run into a single stream. That's the area that this new um, waters of the U.S. is going to um, is going to cover if it becomes final in, in the way it is after the courts get done chewing on it. But as I tell folks, it's a Clean Water Act, so most people are focused on water. But there's another dimension to this, which is land use. And when the Clean Water Act was enacted, uh, there was a, a somewhat elegant compromise that was reached up in Congress with the states who were very protective of their ability to regulate land use uh, on the farm and out there in their areas. They were very protective of that. And this, although it is a re-jurisdictional determination of the areas, it's a very key, key determining line for land use. Because once that jurisdiction gets so far back into the farms and ranches of the United States, the next step or the next implication is going to be regulation, regulation of land use at that level. So it's a big thing to watch. The rule um, was issued on May 27, 2015. It became uh, effective in August. And as I said, it's currently under an injunction. These may be a little hard to see, but this is, you know, uh, it's a kind of a cartoonish depiction of what what was covered before the new rule, you have navigable waters, um, impoundments of navigable waters, and then interstate waters. But if you go now to a graph, you know, you're back up here in the tributaries, and you're moving back up, up the tributaries where you have intermittent and ephemeral streams, things that really just run when it rains. And you can understand the significant concern on the part of agricultural organizations as well as producers. I mean, you try to explain this to a cow-calf operator or a poultry producer, they just look at you and shake their heads and think, how could this be? I mean, it's really phenomenal to them. But it's quite real. 
Same thing um, with these um, um, isolated water bodies. In other words, this, this, this here, now it's not on the main stream, it's an isolated water body such as the Playa Lakes and otherwise that are arguably um, covered. I describe this as where um, the Clean Water Act meets the pasture. Um, there's a redefinition of tributary um, that gets, gets much further back up into the pasture. Um, it's really a concern for your ag and beef producers. Um, it includes the, the definition of tri tributary is where you have an ordinary high water mark and a bed and a bank. Now you may think that's that area that I'm familiar with that I can stand down there and look up at a bed and a bank, something that's really deep and wide, but it's not. Under the rule, let's see, it's where you have, you know, a defined area. I mean, where you have a V. And once you have that V, under the, the, the language of this rule, chances are that is under federal jurisdiction. And that's not only for, um, there are two areas where a producer can get in trouble under the Clean Water Act. One is discharge, 402, if you discharge a pollutant into a stream. The other is 404, which is where a lot of producers get in trouble, and that's basically the dredge and fill core permit. If you clear an area to build a building or for, for some other improvement on the farm, and that's in a jurisdictional area and you don't have a core permit, you can be subject to fines up to $37,000 a day. There's a court case up in Wyoming right now where a small producer um, sought to build a tank to water his cows. Got permission from the state of Wyoming to um, build a dam, small dam, but they in looked at his engineering, it was fine, gave him a full approval to build this little impoundment. And so he had a tank, like exists all over this state, um, to, um, to water his cows. But the EPA came in and determined that that was a jurisdictional area. He, of course, did not have his 404 core permit, and so immediately they ordered him to tear the dam down. That's in litigation now, again, employing many, many of uh, able-bodied lawyers out there who need work too. But the point is, is this is a very hard to understand and a very mysterious thing to producers. You have people out there who are doing the right thing. He went to the state of Wyoming to get permission to build this, but yet finds himself on the end of an enforcement action by the EPA just for building a dam um, to water his cows. This map here is kind of interesting. Um, when, when U.S. Congress had hearings on the waters of the U.S., uh, Chairman Smith asked the EPA if they had any uh, maps as a part of their, their rule proposal, and they sort of shuffled their shoes and said, well, yeah, we do have a few maps. They produced those, and there are maps online um, in, in uh, the, the um, U.S. House website for every state and the United States. But the reason Texas is so yellow is the yellow is what denotes ephemeral or intermittent streams, those places that only run when it rains. But those are all jurisdictional. So you can imagine if you scope down to this land area a light tighter, that's a massive area that is subject to, to jurisdiction. Same thing for wetlands, that's the map that uh, EPA turned over. This is a little more description of the areas, but you know, here are the concerns. My biggest concern about this for ag producers who are busy people and who have enough on their platter anyway this is impossible to understand. It's impossible to go out there in the pasture and determine whether is that area jurisdictional or not. And I would expect even the best of county agents in Texas, if you called them out there and said, is that area jurisdictional, they're not going to know either. Why does this matter at, at, at a climate change? This is, again, this is a very complicated set of regulations that are being put upon nationwide on every ag producer. Because we are the stewards and the owners of almost all the land area in the United States. Rules like this have a huge impact on us. They're going to have very little, if any, impact on the coal plants or the cities. It's ag that's going to bear the brunt of this regulation. Um, but the courts are going to sort that out, so stay tuned. Uh, but for those of you who deal with producers, 
there are lots and lots of questions. I've probably given eight or nine speeches on this to different groups, and everybody still has a very hard time getting their hands around it. All right, shifting gears, um, water in Texas, um, everybody in here, most everybody knows, except those maybe from Florida, um, we govern our water quite differently. Uh, there are valid explanations for this, but you don't want to hear them. Um, surface water is governed by TCQ, which is our state EPA. Um, in essence, water that is on the surface, which is rivers, lakes, streams, ponds, it's all owned by the state of Texas. You have to have a permit to withdraw it, and it's, it's subject to a set of rights. Compare that with groundwater. Groundwater is privately owned. It is 100% owned vested property right by the, by, the, by the owner of the land. And the only regulation that really exists is by what we call groundwater conservation districts, which are locally oriented, primarily aquifer uh, specific groundwater conservation districts that register the wells and can set volumes on pumping. This is just some statistics on groundwater versus surface water, and this underscores what some of the earlier speakers talked about today is, well, I think um, Dr. Mays called it crack cocaine, which I suppose that it may be. Um, but groundwater Texas uses 10.2 million acre feet per year. You talk about climate change and people disagree over whether, you know, whether it's real and if so, what cause and everything else. But if you're an ag producer, um, these little charts will tell you the kind of change you're dealing with. This is July of this year, and this is a drought map. It's put out by the state. The darker the color, the harder the drought. And you see by Ju in July, which is a little strange, it's not a very hard drought. That's October. That's just a few months later. And strangely, over here in East Texas, it's a much harder drought than it is in the western part of the state, which is maybe the revenge of West Texas. Less than a month later, this is the situation. All of that in October, one month before that, it just disappears. Which means it's like, well, that wasn't much of a drought. The reality is, it's like, we got so much rain that people are having to water their cows by kayak. <laughs> this is a map of all the Texas water resources. The, here are the aquifers, um, the groundwater aquifers that, that were um, produced. Just a little bit about groundwater conservation districts. They probably have one of the hardest jobs in state government because they're paid uh, very little. Uh, but they're expected at a local level to, in essence, study the aquifers, determine uh, what they want that aquifer level to be in the future, and then tell their neighbors, local friends, people who are trying to make a living that uh, they can't pump as much as they want to pump. And you may say, well, you told me that that's privately owned property. How can they do that? That's the tension. And these are volunteer boards that are put in the position of having to, to preserve the health of that aquifer and tell their producers um, what they can produce and how much they can produce. So it's still, it, that's a very, very touchy area that, that exists out in, in rural Texas right now. This gives you an idea of how many groundwater conservation districts we have in Texas. Every color you see there is a different groundwater conservation district, a private volunteer board. And not all of them do everything the same way. Stock tanks are uh, reasonably um, you know, it's unchanged and level um, um, law in Texas for producers. But one conundrum that has occurred to me is, you know, the almighty holy grail of Texas ag producers is the 200 acre foot uh, stock tank that you can build that is an exempt as long as it is for domestic and livestock purposes. But jump back to waters of the United States. I mean, it's sort of lore and most of your producers know if I've got a little stream or a non-navigable stream in Texas, I can put a dam across that with TCEQ's blessing, fill it up, water my cows from that. But what about the producer from Wyoming? If that's now a jurisdictional area, do we have producers who are in peril of the state of Texas telling them you can put that dam there and impound water for your cows, but somehow you are in harm's way from, from the federal jurisdictional standpoint? It's a very difficult situation for them to be in. 
the hot topic in uh, water law right now, particularly in the ag, is certainly in groundwater. There are lots of disputes, uh, so much so that our um, Texas Supreme Court has gotten interested and almost views itself as a water court now. The Day case, if you're not familiar with it, sort of a ground-breaking uh, case by the Texas Supreme Court, which fully, finally, and absolutely determined that groundwater is owned by the, um, the owner. It also said, in using analogy to oil and gas law, it said if the groundwater conservation district improperly determines that you can't produce the volume you wish or tells you you can't produce at all, now bear in mind their, their job is to preserve the health of the aquifer, but the Supreme Court said if they do their job incorrectly, that's a taking, a constitutionally um, 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 redressable taking. In other words, the landowner who owns the water would have a taking case uh, back against the district. As these things happen, it sure did. The next case that came up through the courts uh, of relevance is the Bragg case. Um, it worked itself up a couple of pecan farmer, or sorry, pecan farmer had two different places. It's in the Edwards and they wanted permits for each, groundwater permits for each. One of them, the district, the Edwards told them you can have a reduced volume and one of them told them you can't have any volume at all. They went down to their lawyer, the lawyer sued the Edwards and it worked itself through the courts and the court determined that that was a taking. So you have a landowner who owns his water beneath his property, the district has told him on one place you can't have any water and on the other place you can only pump less than you want to pump for your pecan farms. They bring the taking action and then they recovered damages against the district. So it's, it, it, law works ugly. It's not our best policy making tool that exists, but that's where most of the groundwater is, is, is law and policy is being made right now. So the Bragg case, they asked for the Texas Supreme Court to take that case, they declined it. So that case is, 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 is full final and, and existing law based on the Court of Appeals decision. But there'll be more of those cases to come. A case that was argued about a month ago to the Texas Supreme Court, it's pretty interesting, um, Coyote Lake Ranch, which is a pretty cool name for a ranch. Um, it deals with severed groundwater. As there is greater demand and greater value on groundwater, you have lots of landowners, now they know it's my property, it's a valuable asset, I can sell that off. I can sever my groundwater just like I can sever my oil and gas rights. And what I'm seeing in, in others that watch this area is you're seeing trends develop such that groundwater law is tracking very closely with oil and gas law. Lots of analogies the Supreme Court is sort of using back and forth. This Coyote Lake Ranch case is one where they're asking the Texas Supreme Court to adopt a oil and gas doctrine to groundwater. <coughs> called the Accommodation Doctrine. The factual background is that Lubbock, a long time back, I think it was in 1953, really seeing the future, bought a massive set of severed groundwater rights from underneath this ranch. So they've held them. And in that transaction, they defined what surface rights they might use on the surface to produce that groundwater. Time moves forward. The surface of the ranch is then owned by um, the current owners, Coyote Lake Ranch. And Lubbock decides they want to go in and start to produce their severed groundwater in earnest. So they approach the ranch owner and say, okay, we're going to lay pipelines this way, we're going to mow this, and here's where all our equipment's going to be. And they're looking around and thinking, what are you talking about? And of course, the deed records reflected the groundwater um, had been severed off. That's not the issue. The issue is you've got an active working ranch on the surface there, and there is this tension. If Lubbock, with its property right in the severed groundwater, wants to come produce it, it's going to have to build equipment and a lot of equipment on top of the ranch. So that's when the fight ensues between the two over what rights does a holder of severed groundwater have to the surface. Oil and gas, that's quite clear. Minerals are the dominant estate and there's a reasonable right to use the surface whether the surface owner likes it or not. That's not the case yet in groundwater. But that's sitting at the Texas Supreme Court right now. 
And what they're asking is that the Supreme Court apply what is called the accommodation doctrine in favor of the landowner to say, if Lubbock is going to come in and produce that groundwater from my surface, and I'm a surface only, they should have to reasonably accommodate my surface use. Interesting case, but the broader point here is, you know, in central Texas where we have some massive groundwater projects going, basically for cities. We in the ag community, we've known for years that there's going to be a lot of production of groundwater that is moved to the cities because they can afford to pay for it. Getting from here to there, number one, you hope the landowners and the farmers and the ag community are appropriately compensated in that transaction, but you also hope that they have appropriate uh, leverage or rights in their surface to ensure that what they do on the surface of those properties is not destroyed in the process. So that's important because more and more groundwater is going to be produced and where you have owners and operators who are not all that familiar with how these things are going to go and how to structure their transactions, it could place them in peril. Um, Amicus briefs just gives you an idea of how um, key it is to the Ag. Texas Farm Bureau filed an amicus brief as well as the cattle raisers and the cattle feeders. Um, of course, advocating for the application of this accommodation doctrine because they see this coming. Number one, they want a system in place where if they choose to sell and market their groundwater rights, there is a, 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 a structure in place. But two, you don't want somebody being able to come into your surface um, and completely destroy your current surface use. <coughs> so watch for that case to come out. Okay, water quality. Um, EPA and CAFOs, an area I've spent a substantial amount of time in. CAFOs, if you're not familiar, are confined animal feeding operations, large facilities, poultry, dairy, beef feedlots. This is a big, big focus and has for about the past five years for EPA um, to, to focus on CAFOs. Um, so if you are involved in, in CAFOs and, and knowledgeable about them, they're going to be undergoing increased scrutiny. And in fact, I think in some small part, the waters of the U.S. rule is, is, is targeted at this uh, because EPA has wanted to reach uh, agriculture and regulate the nutrient runoff more closely as well as manure, um, but it's, it's had jurisdictional problems doing so. Um, the areas of focus application field when you apply um, manure, um, how much runoff, what is the agronomic value um, to those soils uh, that is contributing to the, uh, the streams that is running off um, and, and downstream. Stacking of litter for uh, poultry. Which brings us to this case. How many people in here are familiar with the Des Moines, City of Des Moines litigation? Two or three. It's an interesting case. I think most people think of Iowa as a, a, a farm state. Um, city of Des Moines, which is uh, downstream, let's run to, uh, there's a little map here. Um, here's Des Moines. And then upstream, of course, what you have are farms. And this is a nutrient loading issue, but it tells you how significant this problem is because the city of Des Moines, in a farm state has sued these three counties up there in real farm country outside of, of the city over nutrient loading. Come back. Because the city of Des Moines water treatment is having to spend close to a million dollars filtering out these nutrients. Now up in these counties these farms are 100% compliant with the Clean Water Act. They're farming with good practices. They're not engaging in any illegal activities. The reality is, according to Des Moines, the counties could and should do more to set regulations on those farms. So if you're a farmer back upstream up there, you're doing what the law says, you're doing what good agronomic practices are to raise your corn, your hogs, or whatever it is that you're doing. But you've got this process taking place down below you, downstream, where Des Moines is actually suing the counties, who probably have very little money anyway, and putting the pressure on the counties to say, look, you've got to go 
impose these layers of regulation on top of the farms that exist within your county. It was a very surprising development in sort of, I'll call it the ag environment world in which I live. Um, and it's notable because of that. You've got a city in a farm state suing counties in a farm state saying, look, you've got to go stand down um, on, on top of your farmers more steeply. And the reality is it's, it's all a function of just nutrient loading. There's nothing else uh, going on other than excess nitrogen and phosphorus that happens to be running off uh, with the rains. But that case is reasonably new and it's, um, you know, it's gonna work its way through the courts. It's a Citizen Act suit. Okay, ag and climate change. I mean, just a few of the factors that <coughs> going to have to deal with um, the impacts on agriculture. Weeds, disease, and pests. We talked a little bit about that. The a and Law School had a whole day um, symposium on sustainability and we had a, uh, a law professor come in and really talk about invasive species and, and, and weeds. It's an enormous problem and as climate changes that's going to be a, a, a big, big factor. This is going to be a little hard to see, I realize, but um, these, these are sort of predictions at the um, temperature changes that you're going to see. You know, I remember growing up in Dallas, my grandfather farmed in Kansas. You could follow that wheat harvest, go all the way up, because the temperatures just changed a little bit as you go north. And as everything continues to shift up there, it's really going to have a profound impact on the, uh, the crops and the land use changes across the country. Greenhouse gases, another small, non-controversial topic. I mean, we, we're, we're agriculture, so we tend to think, well, we do what we do, and we'll do it better, but greenhouse gases is just, a, you know, that's a fact of life with us. Um, but the reality is, as the intensity of climate change regulation and greenhouse gas regulation takes place internationally as well as nationally, um, we show up on that pie chart and there is a lot of pressure out there because we are a representative piece of this pie on greenhouse gas contribution um, <coughs> to do something about it. So I think although it is difficult and it is non you know, it's non-traditional to look at ag for greenhouse gases, that's going to happen. Because the other industries that are going to be more strictly regulated are not going to go down and let regulations come upon them and leave this piece of the pie chart here, which is us, uh, unregulated. And I explain this to producers and they shake their head again. It's like, you're just telling me bad news I don't want to hear. But this is a real, real reality because these things are going to be set in Washington, if not Paris or otherwise. But ag uh, is on the radar screen there. Here's the carbon footprint. <coughs> you know, b basically based on protein source, if you will, and your ruminants uh, are, are, are the target. I mean, they're the hardest, and then if you choose to eat only chicken, eggs, meat, meat substitutes, whatever that is, uh, beans, peas, and soy, it's, you know, it's very small contribution. But those first four bars, I mean, that's production livestock agriculture. That's a big, big part of what we do in the country and what we do well, and they are, uh, in the total, not an enormous set of contributions, but they're a notable set of contributions to, to, to carbon. And there are a lot of forces at play to, um, to, to, to regulate them. Here's greenhouse gas emissions from the ag sector 90 through 2013, which are you know, relatively, relatively um, constant. Crops are orange is the big part, and then livestock here. Um, beef folks are probably in the, in, in the biggest crosshairs um, in terms of uh, greenhouse gas regulation. I think I'm about out of time. Those are two cows on pretty grass, so that's it. I'll take a couple of questions on the last time I have. 